the way that Italians themselves tend to visualize the history of their own cuisine tends to be very often through stories about individual dishes. And the stories they tell about those dishes are mostly complete cobblers. But they are all the same very important stories because they're identity narratives, essentially. Just picking a random example, in Venice they a thing called bacala, which is, is actually uh, what they call stockafis or stockfish elsewhere. Confusingly, they use the wrong name for this. And you, you, it's even used in producers' publicity and stuff. There is a 14th, sorry, 15th century traveler's account by this poor um, Venetian sailor who, whose name escapes me for the moment, who got shipwrecked somewhere off Ireland and amazingly ended up in Norway and told the whole story. He was, his, book was, uh, his story was collected in a book of traveller's tales um, and um, became a very famous story. And he gives us the first Italian account of stockfish hanging up to dry in the cold winds of Norway. I don't know if you're familiar with the process. Um, and it's big, you know, stockfish is one of those signature dishes. It's popular in Reggio, Calabria, Messina, and various other places um, in Italy. Um, and they light onto that and think, that's how we began. Our tradition of stockfish eating goes all the way back to then, and a line of continuity was established what an ancient tradition, how venerable our eating habits are. Um, the fact is, if you read the account by that traveller, okay, yes, he got some stockfish, but he sold it at the first port he came to in Norway to buy some boots so that he could get back home. And the next reports, all the historical reports of stockfish after that, tell us how disgusting it was. And that it was basically a... Uh, a lean day food. You know, the church divided uh, divided the diet into lean days and fat days. And so it's something you, you ate when you had to. Much, much later, it became cuisine. It became food. It became something that people told stories about and built their identities around. So um, in many ways, it's a lot easier to tell the story of that powerful local identification with food, which is really one of the signature traits of Italian food culture, than it is to trace the history of individual dishes. Very quickly, the other myth, of course, is Marco Polo and pasta. Uh, pasta was around 150, in Italy 150 years before Marco Polo was born. Marco Polo, however, didn't bring, so he didn't bring pasta into Italy, but he did bring it into the United States of America, which is a remarkable achievement for somebody from the 14th century. Because the story about him traveling to China and bringing back sp spaghetti was invented in the late 1920s by the Macaroni Manufacturers Association of the United States, who at the time, it, they were all Italians, obviously. Well, the, the guy invented it was probably Calabrian, in fact. And, <laughs> and they, they were desperate to sell their spaghetti, to break out of the Italian ghettos and sell their spaghetti. So they had to de-Italianize it in some way. And this was the objective of this story, was to make pasta seem a bit like, less like a kind of Dago food. Um, and uh, anyway, that's how that story took off. So beware these little individual narratives about individual foods. They're almost all wrong. Thank you. Thank you. After many, 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 many years, thousand years, now we got this beautiful, this beautiful treasure, this beautiful power, the food, the South Italian cooking. I mean, if you, if you think about Italian cuisine, you usually do not associate this to spicy food, are you? Spicy food, you think about Thai, Indian, in Calabria South, we eat a lot of spicy food. Because we had this whole invasion, all these people teach us how to, how, to, how to eat. And it was not just the way we eat, the way, to, the, the way we preserve, okay, the way we cook, and, and all the rest. So this, 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 water, this water is a very particular and different about South Italia. Uh, Sicily, Calabria, Puglia, uh, Basilicata, Sardinia. If you talk about fregola, for example, 
You ever heard about fragola? It's kind of small couscous, toasted couscous. So it's not an Italian thing, but in Sardinia, it's one of the main dishes. Yeah. So it's also um, interesting that the Germanic tribes um, are, are actually responsible for meat curing. They brought in um, the techniques which now produce prosciutto di parma, colatello, all the things that we hopefully all love. The most interesting feature of Roman cuisine and one that is really fascinates me to no end is the idea of the, the Roman Jewish cuisine, which we sort of describe using the singular, la cucina romana ebraica, but it's so many cuisines under one umbrella of a very small community, which was over 50,000 members in antiquity, and today's about 13,000. Um, and when we talk about sort of contemporary cuisine in Italy, we tend to be talking about cuisine that is 15 or 50 years old, whereas the sort of cucina ebraica, as we know it, um, which is still preserved in homes, and to some extent in a few restaurants in the Jewish ghetto, um, we've got dishes that are not just indigenous to that particular 22 century long presence of Jews in Rome, but uh, more likely arrived in the 1490s when Jews were expelled from southern Italy, which included Sicily, um, uh, Calabria, and then several decades later, uh, Naples as well. Um, if you visit this fantastic um, bakery called Bocchon in Forna Ghetto, which is right on the main street in the, the modern ghetto. Of course, the Jewish ghetto, which was established in 1555 and ended in 1870, no longer survives. The buildings are gone, but you still have places that are dedicated to continuing the culinary traditions of the community. And at Bocchon, you find um, marzipan cookies. Um, you find a type of pizza, pizza ebraica. Um, it's a sweet uh, dough. Um, into which pine nuts, raisins, candied fruits um, are incorporated. Um, flavor palette and a, sort of, uh, a, a visual um, type of thing that, that evokes Sicilian desserts. Um, and so we have this fabulous contamination of what perhaps at the time of the arrival of these Sephardic Jews from Spain would have been called invaders, um, but which have been fully assimilated into the, the Roman Jewish cuisine and plenty of 15th and 16th century documents tell of Jews arriving from the south of Italy and Spain and their traditions being adopted. Um, to enrich the community even further, in 1967, about 4,000 Jews arrived in Rome from Libya. And today, a 13,000 member community is about one third uh, Libyan Sephardic. And so right beside the deep fried artichokes of the ghetto, you find pasta that's cooked with um, otarga, um, dried mullet brown, things that are typical of that North African Sephardic cuisine. The main motor of Italian food culture through the ages has been cities. We um, mistakenly and bafflingly in some ways, given you know, what the peasants themselves might have thought of us, tend to think of Italian food as being peasant food. Uh, that being its defining characteristic. Um, and it's simply not true. Um, there, there's countless historical documents that tell us that the peasants ate very, very badly. Um, and, you know, in, in, in it, as recently as the fascist era, uh, there were many people in government were extremely worried that the peasants didn't know how to feed themselves properly. You know, they didn't even know how to use the little they had. Um, there are undoubtedly elements of the great mosaic of uh, Italian cuisine that have peasant origins, but it's really urban food traditions that are that have created Italian food culture. They've been the kind of poles that have of, of expertise, of resources, of markets. You know, that's where all of these ingredients from the hinterland of Italy cities were concentrated, where the, the cooks went, where there was competition for social prestige, where ideas were exchanged in, in food as in, is, as in anything else. Um, and that's why you know, in, 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 this business of naming cities acquiring a reputation for certain foods began in the Middle Ages. Uh, when the Italian city system um, re-emerged, reasserted its political and economic 
uh, independence and primacy. Um, and very early on, you get a kind of form of urban branding. You know, Parmigiano is the, perhaps the, the classic example, or, you know, Pavia known for what is now Grana. Um, and there are lots and lots of other examples. Um, because they were, the cities were selling their wares to each other. Uh, in a kind of trade system. And so it made sense, and, and guilds and people formed to protect that brand identity of the food. There are famous that you can see now, if you ever go to a sort of mortadella stall at Slow Food or something like that, you'll see these famous sort of uh, 15th, 16th century bandy, these laws put up that determine the quality of mortadella and stuff like that, because they were protecting their, the reputation of their product collectively um, as, a, as a city guild. If you look at the recipe, it's actually quite different. There's a lot more spices than now, but that, that doesn't stop people, of course, building a great you know, tradition around it. Historically, let's say in the in the 19th and 20th centuries, we're speaking of um, we're often speaking of a, a cuisine that's not native to Rome, but one that was arriving with immigrants from Abruzzo or Calabria or what is today Basilicata, people desperately impoverished who were fleeing the South, who were not able to go to the United States or other places after unification, and were truly living off of foraged foods, whereas many established Romans were purchasing things in markets or had proper housing um, versus the, many of the immigrants who were, who were living in makeshift hovels. Um, and you can even walk down the Via del Mandrione today and see the, the legacy of, of the, the homes of Pugliesi and uh, Calabrian peasants who were living in this area where still we have spontaneous plants growing everything from mallow and arugula um, to cardoons at times, things that people truly were living on in, in this true manifestation of the Cucina Povera, which today is, of course, completely transformed. This nostalgia that Italians have for rustic food, for peasant food, for Cucina Povera, which has achieved many, many great things, um, and, you know, I'm a huge fan of it myself, is, um, itself has a history. And it's really only when Italians leave the countryside behind. Italy has a very delayed passage into an era of a high-protein diet and an industrial economy. It really only happens after the Second World War in the 1950s. So that poverty is a relatively recent historical memory. Um, and it's only when the countryside had safely been left behind that you start to get rustic nostalgia and the brand that really encapsulates that is il mulino bianco the the biscuits you, you, if you've been to italy you must you must have seen them and they were originally mar sold in sort of brown paper bags it, and they were deliberately industrially manufactured in slightly irregular shapes like they'd been homemade there's amazing irony <laughs> to that um and uh, you know, th th they set their, this, th they, they took off enormously following this highly successful advertising campaign that everybody in Italy can remember. And it's still, you see the elements of it. They still play off it. Set in this mill in a place called Chiusdino, uh, not far from Siena, which was supposed to be uh, the incarnation of the happy, rustic life. Um, and we need to be a bit aware of it because Italians are as vulnerable as anybody else to the idea that everything was lovely and happy and um, foods were all genuine in the past and stuff like that. I mean, one problem that we underestimate about the past of Italian food is the amount of fraud that went on. You see all the, you know, the historical records, all these food frauds, you know, all kinds of horrors sold as cheese and God knows what else. You know, the, the, thank God for modern regulations and legislation on that matter. Yeah. You know, sometimes when you think about spaghetti meatballs, you think about Italian dish, it's not. 
When you think about fettuccine Alfredo, you think it's an Italian dish, but it's not. When you think about Caesar salad, you know it's American. Mm. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's Italian. <laughs> so this is a great thing. This is this, 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 this why Italy is so viewed. This is why Italy is so versatile. This is why Italy, we never agreed on anything. It is still <laughs> reflects this mm. politics. I mean, if I talk with my mom, I say, Mom, this is the way we do cavatelli. I put in my hands, say, ah, your mom, she doesn't know anything. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the things that really, really upset me more is uh, when people say, especially in the UK, forget about what they said. Uh, oh, of course, I can do a bowl of pasta. Anyone can do a bowl of pasta. So what I'm doing here. Mm. <laughs> Even a pasta for a pizza is a gourmet dish, if you follow an Italian. Oh, pasta al dente is no good. No, it's good for you because we Italians and we tell you to do it in the right way. Okay? So, and these things sometimes they make me quite annoyed. About, oh, everybody can do pasta. Everybody can do ah, pasta and pizza. But, well, mm. you know what? Italy is not all about pasta and pizza. It's about south, it's about Mediterranean, it's about north, it's about salami. That's why I think Italy has got this big power and there's a lot more we can give away. Mm. Lots more to give you guys because uh, there is uh, the regionality, there is the family, there is. Or everything. The only problem we've got is that we never agree to anything. When we talk about food exclusively through traditions, we forget how innovative and creative Italian food culture is. You know, ciabatta was invade, invented in the 1980s by a, uh, an entrepreneur, entrepreneur from Verona, I think. Um, th these are, you know, novelties that are coming up and you know, learning how to use them, spreading them. Um, so Italy's a great laboratory. Amalfice, which is in the northeastern part of Lazio, uh, claims ownership over the recipe Amalficiana, um, which is it's an interesting it's an interesting claim um, because it's difficult to base this in any documented historical fact. Um, and of course, when we study many recipes, especially the recipes that have been codified in the Roman canon in the, during the 20th century, um, we find a lot of anecdotal accounts of how things came to be. Um, in, you know, in, in Amatisha, uh, if you order Amatrishana, at times you're served what in Rome we would call a gricha, which is pasta tossed with rendered either pancetto or guanciale fat, depending on the cook. Um, sometimes with black pepper, often with black pepper, sometimes no pepper. So, you know, when we talk about defined recipes, there's constant debate over what actually a peasant pasta dish would have included, and black pepper likely would have been omitted if we believe the claim that Amatrishana is as old as, as the people of Amatrisha say. Um, in, in Rome, many, many chefs contest and said that it's a Roman dish, um, that peasants coming from the Apennines after unification brought their cured pork jowls and pork bellies and various things and would use the rendered fat when dressing pasta, which at the time would not be the bucatini that we encounter today, but would have been a simple flour and water pasta, the most basic form. Um, and then it was later enriched with black pepper when that became more affordable. So what we have are a lot of, a lot of claims to provenance, but no, not necessarily a, a documentary basis for those claims. What's really fun is that you can go to Amatrice for the Sagre di Amatriciana and you can eat it like by the kilo. Um, and, and that's been really great for Amatrice. And to go back to the original question, like what is a, what's this hyper-regionality, what's this contesting provenance all about? And you know, in modern times, food ownership has become really critical to promoting tourism, particularly in places that have, been, uh, have had their population depleted or have had their industry disappear. Um, and so it's in such a complicated it's such a complicated story, but I do understand the passion behind the people of Amatisha at essentially excommunicating Chef Carlo Craco. <laughs> I think I think the point was he put onion in garlic, garlic. garlic. Okay, oh, so God. if you look at like whatever 1950s recipes, you find garlic, you find no garlic, yeah. you find onion, it, 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 it black reminds pepper, no black pepper. It's like there's so many variations. <laughs> Amatisha is not even in Lazio, is it? It's, it's in the province of Rieti. Rieti, yeah. so it's Lazio then. Vision. So why? I mean, usually they use uh, uh, the, the old version of uh, of a matriciano, or gricio, you know, is the onion. But the guy put garlic. They really upset them. Mm. Mm. It, it reminds me of watching watching Jamie's Italy from behind the sofa when he when he 
went down to these places and reinterpreted local dishes and, and you know, that was all the people. That was, my mom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was, um, <laughs> but the, 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 the facet, <laughs> yeah, yeah, there was, uh, but Kate, but Kate, yeah. Kate is absolutely right here, is that this idea of that there is a canonical way of doing a dish is, is, is from the era of recipe books and, you know, uh, consumer food culture. Uh, it, it, I think it's relatively recent. I mean, and you can trace it. I traced it through the, the exemplary case I used is pesto, where all kinds of uh, evidence of pesto existing, and they made it without any kind of old stuff, you know, marjoram, parsley, right, right, the, with pine nuts, without pine nuts, different and kinds of nuts, yeah. different kind of cheese. The raw recipe with Dutch cheese in it. I mean, you know, anything. <laughs> uh, and it's really only after the Second World War that you get this, you know, canonical five ingredients going on and you start to, you know, you get traditions being invented like the world pesto championships. But, but, um, ironic, ironically, having written up this about pesto, I got invited to Genoa to be a judge in the 2010 World Pesto al Nortaio Championship. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm like, I can't distinguish a basil leaf from a parsley. So I just copied from my neighbouring judge. But, the, um, <laughs> The, the uh, what was I going to say? The, the, so it, it, it's a it's a it's a recent thing, and it also has economic motives, because Italy has been a huge beneficiary, and we've all been huge beneficiaries, because it's improved the quality and you know streamlined Italian food, make it make it more exportable, more available. European Union legislation on provenance of foods, regulating that adding value to these local products, which undoubtedly are there. There are these rich, and they get elaborated. And, uh, you know, there's a long story behind that. Oh, I, don't, I don't want to go, go on to it. You cannot really take leads on a future of people or future of cooking, like Italy, okay, and make it so simple, so easy, like, everybody can do that. It's not acceptable. Okay. If the Bologna is, that's our rules. A Manichan has our rules to make it. If 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 if, if, if uh, Alfredo Disagree. is not Italian, <laughs> disagree. <laughs> I think what's really beautiful about Italian Italian regional cuisines is that you can have the concept of a matriciana, but every cook makes it his or her own, and you are immediately connected to the cook because of the choices that they make in their kitchen, whether it's their family tradition or the evolution of tradition. So what I actually really love, even though I'm not like a super fan of Krakow's version of Amatriciana, for example, uh, what I love is that we are we have the right to personalize these things. It doesn't make them less Italian, per se, which is why we can produce Italian dishes outside of, outside of Italy, which is why we can embrace the sensibility of certain Italian sensibilities outside of Italy. You know, well, well, yeah, fine. I mean, creativity as the last person in Ireland that was a chef like to create things. But if a matigiana is made out of one chalet, pecorino, like pepper and tomato, <coughs> that's the ingredient you have to use. Mm. If you want to put tomato first or after or cheese first or after, and the, and the result is good, that's your problem. But that's some of the recipe you need to be respected. I hate the rules being broken as well. I'm quite I'm anal excited. about yeah, I'm quite so. anal about that. And, and, I, and I wanted to, in the process, to make an argument actually in favour of the existence of Italian cuisine. It's clearly nonsense to talk about a single Italian cuisine if by that you mean a single menu. You know, any country where you can get goulash in the Dolomites and couscous sure. in Trapani, you know, we're, di we're in different food worlds. Um, but there are many things, the, 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 the sort of syntax of the, the, the menu, antipasto, primo, secondo, dolce, and so on. And I think this sense of rules as well about, you know, you don't put cheese on fish, you don't put cheese on mushrooms, you know, many people believe in. You don't, you know, have a cappuccino after about half past ten in the morning and so on and so forth. This, the, these certain recipes may have to be made in certain ways, although of course 
we've already talked about the dis number of disagreements there are about those ways. I think that sense of rules is really important. It's one of the defining traits of Italian food culture, along with what I've said about the city things. And I think the two are linked because it's really about manners. It's about, um, you know, it reminds me of the, you know, the great Renaissance uh, uh, manners book written by Giovanni della Casa, the, the Galateo, where he gave, you know, famous rules like, you know, never blow your nose and then look in the handkerchief <laughs> as if jewels had come it's out of that, um, which is, is uh, something I've tried to obey all the rest of my life since reading that as a student. But it's, and, and he was writing it, of course, because it was about maintaining an identity and a sense of self and a, creating a prestige and aura around yourself in a court environment, in the Renaissance court. And there's some element of that, I think, in this Italian obsession with rules around food. And, you know, you wipe your mouth after taking a mouthful before the glass goes to your lips and things like that, which are... Um, uh, we associate that with a, a sort of upper class eating uh, aesthetic and it's much more, it's percolated much further down, much earlier, historically speaking, and I think in, in, in Italy. And I think it's to do with that business of identity and how food is um, a powerful way of saying who you are, not just in, you know, your provenance, where you come from. And I, I would prefer... I wouldn't talk in terms of regions because the regions, a lot of them are a recent invention and, you know, there's no such thing food-wise as Campania until very recently. Naples was the capital of a kingdom and sucked in resources from across the kingdom. Cities and their hinterlands are really what we're talking about. And, and that's where this sense of, uh, you know, this inv identity investment in food and the rules surrounding it and in doing it the right way um, comes from. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that makes Italian food what it is.